Hey, fellow men, let me talk to you for a minute. Are you around my age and want to feel young again? What if you, in your prime, could be all the time? The muscles. Seriously? It's like you're photoshopped. The drive. I drive. The libido. Now you take off your dress. No. Everything. Today we're talking about the main thing that makes a man manly, testosterone. Specifically, what happens when your testosterone is low and what people all over the interwebs are doing about it. That's right, today's video is on testosterone replacement therapy. Got my mojo back. I think every guy over 50 should be doing it. I mean, honestly, I like looking at myself in the mirror because I look freaking awesome. In my mind, vitality is beyond age. You can live a good life, a healthy life for your entire life because youthfulness is in enjoying the moment. I also believe that manliness is more than just muscles and facial hair. It can't be reduced to just physical characteristics alone. However, for men, the production of testosterone, the hormone that plays a central role in their physical experience as men, does start to reduce as they age, which can bring along many unwanted effects. Low testosterone is a struggle of many men, particularly older men, but not limited only to them. It can affect anyone, and if it does, we do have treatment options for people seeking to return their body to normal levels. TRT, or testosterone replacement therapy, is becoming increasingly more popular. However, like many of the drugs I've recently covered on this channel, more than just those with a medical condition, in this case low testosterone, are seeking treatment. This is concerning because of what TRT does to your natural reproductive hormone system, which is that it essentially shuts it down. This is why it is so controversial, especially as it makes its way into the hands of impressionable younger men who are using it for fitness gains. Men's testosterone levels are being bombarded. So there's a lot of guys that are turning to TRT as an option to feel better. And when some guys do take it, they feel substantially better. So let's be clear. TRT is not for performance enhancement. To better understand what TRT is for, we'll dive deep into the hormone, testosterone itself, how low levels of it can affect the body, and the medication used to treat these symptoms. We will also touch on the social impacts of TRT in recent years, as it reaches a wider audience of people online who are generally easily influenced, quick to compare, and looking to live their best life, bro. Or at least appear as though they are. Let's get into it, interns. TRT, again, testosterone replacement therapy, is basically hormone, in this case androgen replacement therapy, also known as ART. The purpose is to help men with low testosterone restore their testosterone to a natural level. It is meant to treat those with medically diagnosed symptomatic hypogonadism. Hypogonadism is a disease in which the body is unable to produce normal amounts of testosterone due to a problem with the testicles or with the pituitary gland that controls the testicles. So no, it's not meant to treat normal signs of aging, though many people who take TRT are aging men. However, it is important to figure out which is causing the hypogonadism, aging or the disease, because treatment may vary. For example, in the case of aging, lifestyle changes may be enough to manage the symptoms, whereas with earlier onset hypogonadism, more aggressive treatment methods may be necessary. Because again, if you don't actually need it, you could be making yourself less healthy. If you do need it and you're clinically deficient, in general, you're going to be more prone to things like cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, etc. TRT typically, though not always, involves medications classified as androgens or anabolic steroids. However, what differs from traditional steroid usage is the amount used. For TRT, it's not about getting buff. It is not designed to get you ripped and jacked out of your mind, and in most cases, it simply won't do that. So while they may contain similar chemical compounds, what distinguishes TRT from steroids are the doses, indications, and risks. Because I look freaking awesome. The testosterone replacement is administered in a variety of ways. Subcutaneously, meaning injected beneath the skin, it also comes in the form of pellets, again, placed subcutaneously, that are implanted under the skin before slowly dissolving for release into the bloodstream. Transdermally, meaning absorbed through the skin and systematically distributed throughout the body, 
and topically, which usually refers to local action at a site of application, but in the case of TRT, it too is meant to be absorbed through the skin and systematically distributed throughout the body, so it can enter the bloodstream. Though pills are available, things like Andriol, they have been known to cause liver damage, whereas other methods of delivery bypass the liver altogether and go directly into the blood. They induce changes in the liver, um, which can potentially predispose you to fatty liver and cirrhosis, okay, and florid hepa hepatic failure. These drugs are highly sought after for their effects. I mean, who wouldn't want to feel like Hercules every freaking day, bro? TRT, which is basically getting your testosterone at optimal levels, increases energy levels, it increases cognition and clarity of mind, allowing you to feel mentally sharp and alert, it increases mood and sense of well-being, it increases sexual function while decreasing erectile dysfunction, and it increases lean muscle mass, muscle strength, and bone density. That's a lot of increases. TRT does this simply by increasing testosterone levels. The reason testosterone has such positive effects is because there are androgen receptors throughout the body, including the brain, that are affected by testosterone binding to them. For example, in muscle tissue, binding to these receptors promotes protein synthesis, which is why a lot of bodybuilders use it. In the genitalia, it stimulates libido and so on. However, testosterone can also work in other ways, such as by promoting bone mineralization by enhancing the activity of bone building cells, or osteoblast, facilitating the deposition of minerals onto bone matrix, and regulating the activity of bone resorbing cells, or osteoclasts. So testosterone is a pretty active hormone, and it does a lot of jobs. Two hours more work per day, 30 pounds of fat gone, and muscle more impressive than anything he had in his 20s. However, in order to better understand how testosterone actually is increased, we need to understand the natural testosterone system these drugs are hijacking. This is called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. GnRH tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH. They tell the testes to make testosterone. Small amounts of that are siphoned. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on a second. That was a quick summary from Dr. Peter Atia, who is a physician known for his work in longevity medicine, who we will be hearing from occasionally throughout this video. He has great content on this stuff, which I suggest you all check out. He's definitely a specialist, but for the interns, let's clarify what he just said. The GnRH travels down the pituitary stalk to stimulate specialized cells to produce luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. FSH and LH tell the testes to make testosterone. More specifically, LH acts as a messenger telling the Leydig cells to make testosterone while FSH helps the Sertoli cells support the growth of sperm cells. If you have a 35 year old guy whose testosterone is low, he has the Leydig cells and the Sertuli cells to make testosterone, he just needs the signal. Of the testosterone produced, small amounts are siphoned off by the 5 alpha reductase enzyme to make DHT, or dihydrotestosterone, which we will discuss shortly, and by the aromatase enzyme to convert into estradiol or estrogen. Now. The entire HPG, or hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, is a natural negative feedback loop. As exercise scientist Menno Henselmans explains. That monitors your level of testosterone and estrogen, and based on that, determines how much testosterone it produces. In order to maintain testosterone levels within a certain range, preventing them from becoming too high or too low, as T levels rise, it will signal to the hypothalamus and the pituitary to reduce production of GnRH and LH. Estrogen will also inhibit the secretion of LH. The slowing of the initial release of GnRH is possible due to upstream regulation, which refers to the control of a process at an earlier stage in a regulatory pathway, which in this case involves controlling factors like hormones and environmental cues that influence the hypothalamus's production and release of GnRH. As explained by fitness influencer Ryan Humiston. It all starts with the hypothalamus. This little bastard monitors the hormones in the body via the bloodstream. So basically, it all starts with the hypothalamus and can be summarized by saying that what your body produces will determine what your body produces. Really? You don't say! This is why an increase of exogenous testosterone entering your system, as in TRT, 
or anabolic steroids would signal your natural system to cease production of endogenous testosterone with your hypothalamus thinking that your testes are producing more testosterone than they actually are. Your natural production will completely deteriorate to nothing. Oftentimes your testicles shrink to very close to nothing. If you ever want to come off of TRT, you could be low in testosterone for months and months and months until you come back out. And some people actually never get their natural production back. It's a very small number of people, but it does exist. That's what makes TRT so controversial because it can cause physiological dependence and infertility in some cases. So it's just a whole lot of risk and pain in the ass that you better know what you're signing up for before you sign up for that shit. More on the risks later, but for now, let's return to the natural testosterone production process. I mentioned 5-alpha reductase, siphoning off some of the testosterone to make dihydrotestosterone or DHT. DHT to me is something to be coveted and held on to because you feel so much better when your DHT is in the appropriate range. DHT plays a pivotal role in sexual development in males. In the embryo, it is primarily involved in the sex differentiation of organs and may be responsible for the start of puberty in boys, causing development of the genitals penis, testes, and scrotum, and growth of pubic and body hair. It also promotes prostate growth, but if levels are too high, it can also cause prostate problems. DHT also affects skin oiliness and acne. It is also a major cause of male pattern baldness. Overall, it is responsible for many of the physical characteristics associated with adult males, and like any sex hormone, it is important for sex drive. Almost 10% of the testosterone produced by an adult each day is converted to DHT. And what is very important to note about it is this. Potency, two to 10 X potency for the androgen receptor than testosterone. So both testosterone and DHT bind to androgen receptors. And even though lower levels of DHT are produced, what is produced has a higher affinity to the androgen receptor, meaning that if it binds, it will have more potent androgenic effects. However, testosterone still does its manly thing, given it actually can bind to an androgen receptor and exert its biologic effects. However, very little of the total testosterone that is produced actually manages to do so. Testosterone itself is hydrophobic. Remember, it's synthesized from cholesterol, so at its core, it's a lipid. So it has a hard time traveling through your blood, which is mostly water. In order to travel through the body, testosterone attaches to carrier proteins, SHBG, or sex hormone binding globulin, and albumin. These proteins absorb the majority of the testosterone so that only one or 2% of it is what is considered free testosterone. Free testosterone refers to the portion of testosterone in the bloodstream that is not bound to proteins. This form of testosterone is considered to be biologically active and available for use by cells throughout the body. As Dr. Atia explains, this is a calculated lab value. They measure total testosterone, they measure SHBG and albumin, and they calculate free T. Free testosterone levels are often measured to assess a person's testosterone status because they allow us to know how much testosterone is readily available for physiological functions. Well, I hate to say it's irrelevant. I just don't pay as much attention to it. I pay attention to the free testosterone. How much do you have available for use? So we want the free T. That's what we're concerned about. Though Dr. Huberman points out something important, before we get too hard on the carrier proteins. So you don't want all your testosterone free. You want some of it bound up so that it can be delivered to the different tissues, including your brain. As he goes on to say, too much SHBG, however, prevents the testosterone from, quote, doing its thing. And we obviously want testosterone to do its thing. Given that the free T takes up such a small percentage of total T, men need every bit they can get, especially aging men. Men's testosterone naturally lowers as they age, usually beginning around age 30. Levels generally peak during adolescence and early adulthood, and then gradually decline at a rate of 1% per year. Again, this is a natural process. Men also go through a form of menopause as they age. So yeah, a man's hormones change with age. However, according to urologist Dr. Christopher Debert, only about 15% of men will experience a drop in levels that is clinically significant and requires treatment. Another 2006 study conducted by T. Mulligan et al. notes a slightly higher prevalence of hypogonadism. 
38.7% in men aged 48 years and up, presenting to primary care offices. Whilst these numbers can vary depending on geographic location and the social factors affecting how many men actually seek treatment, it's clear that though it is still a significant amount, it doesn't seem to affect everyone. Other things that can contribute to decreasing testosterone levels are health conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, and chronic illnesses, which can interfere with the body's ability to produce it. Medications such as corticosteroids and opioids can also suppress testosterone production and interfere with hormone regulation. Unhealthy lifestyle habits such as a lack of exercise, poor diet, excessive alcohol consumption, and smoking obviously affect all areas of your health, so it's no surprise they can affect testosterone too. Genetics can also affect levels. Some are just genetically predisposed to having lower testosterone. Levels can also vary depending on factors such as age, sex, and individual differences. That is to stay lifestyle habits. However, a normal level for men is at least 300 nanograms per deciliter, ranging anywhere from 3,000 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. Someone with testosterone levels below 300 would likely be diagnosed with low testosterone. Considering that levels fluctuate throughout the day, your testosterone levels should be measured between 7 and 10 a.m. when it's at its peak and confirmed with a second test on a different day. However, as we've seen with free T, it's not as straightforward as basing a low testosterone diagnosis off of a low total testosterone count. Diagnosis is based primarily on symptomatology, not solely on absolute numbers. And cases are treated in the same way. Meaning, we're treating symptoms, but we're using numbers as a guide to do so. Dr. T explains that even with free T, it's ultimately about your testosterone saturation rather than your levels. Since we don't know the number of androgen receptors an individual has, we can't be sure of their particular sensitivity to testosterone and therefore how much is needed to affect their body. A patient may have low levels and forego treatment because they have no symptoms. In certain cases, a patient may only need a small boost to get big results. Conversely, and, and that's you, why do I don't care if he's outside the range. I might have to get a guy's total T up to 1500 to get his free T to 18. However, doctors generally try to keep it within normal range during treatment. People should only be on a supplemental testosterone, meaning to supplement or replace natural levels, not to boost your performance. Because it is replacement therapy, not enhancement therapy. As explained by Dr. Osborne, Chief of Neurosurgery at St. Mary's Medical Center. High 900s, some of them run 1100. That's where you're going. Anybody else is super physiologic and we are reducing the dosages. Like on normal medically respons uh, responsible and medically supervised TRT, you are essentially natural. It's important to understand that TRT isn't meant to give you a physiological advantage, but to treat the unwanted symptoms. Therefore, the focus for both diagnosis and treatment is symptomatology. Those symptoms can be mind-related, like depression, reduced self-confidence, difficulty concentrating, and disturbed sleep. Or they can also be body-related, like a decline in muscle and bone mass, increased body fat, fatigued, swollen and tender breasts, and flushing and hot flashes. They can also affect your sexual organs and include lower sex drive, fewer spontaneous erections, and difficulty keeping erections. If you are diagnosed with low testosterone or hypogonadism, the next thing to determine is if your failure to make testosterone is a central or a peripheral issue. Why is my T low? Is it low because my brain isn't saying the right thing or is it low because my body can't do it? It's about targeting where the issue is coming from and determining an adequate treatment plan for the patient's needs because sometimes there are indirect ways of solving the issue. Central or secondary hypogonadism refers to there being an issue with the signal from the brain to the testes. In this case, it would be pointless to give more testosterone because if you already have all the raw material, he just needs the signal. Essentially, the brain just needs to say, hey, get cooking. So treatment would probably focus more on the pituitary. On the other hand, peripheral or primary hypogonadism refers to a functional issue within the testes themselves. In this case, exogenous testosterone would likely be the answer. This shows the importance of considering surrounding factors before actually beginning any sort of treatment. 
figuring out if you can top out the natural signal, I feel is the first thing to do. Another one of those factors would be SHBG. If you remember, this is the sex hormone binding globulin or testosterone's carrier protein that basically controls the amount of testosterone your body's tissues can use. But if your total testosterone is in range, but your free testosterone is not, then the SHBG is to blame. Hormones that affect SHBG levels are estradiol, insulin, and thyroxine. If you have a high aromatase activity or simply high estrogen, which can occur due to conditions like obesity or certain medications, your SHBG can increase. If your insulin is high, again associated with obesity and diabetes, SHBG production can increase. Conversely, low insulin levels that can happen with type 1 diabetes or even during a low carb diet or fasting can also cause SHBG to increase. And if testosterone levels don't go up with it, then... The great irony of helping a person get metabolically healthy is in the short run, you can actually lower their free testosterone, all things equal. Another hormone that affects SHBG is thyroxine or your thyroid hormone. This hormone plays a crucial role in metabolism and hormonal balance. And generally, higher levels of this can cause SHBG to increase as well. Basically, you gotta make sure that your T4 is in check. All of this to say, there are other factors that can affect your body's natural ability to produce adequate levels of testosterone that you can address before trying TRT. Doing your due diligence, making sure that you're actually helping your body maximize the testosterone it is making before bringing exogenous testosterone into your body. As Dr. Huberman points out, if a male of any age is not trying to get decent sleep, exercise, appropriate nutrition, minding their social connections, et cetera, et cetera. If you're not doing at least those things, going straight to the drug seems like a bad idea. And it's even more important when you are in the fitness industry and you have a regimented diet and often exhaustive exercise plan. The basics like micronutrient intake, macros, are you eating enough to recover relative to your training stimulus? But let's say that you've done what you can and your testosterone levels still aren't in balance. You're experiencing undesirable symptomatology. Then the next step would probably be medication. I've already mentioned the forms exogenous testosterone can come in. Injections, pellets, patches, and gels. But there are a few other treatment considerations I wanna mention. Dosages obviously vary, but concentration and frequency can affect how favorably your body receives the medication. Depending on where you go to have it administered, you may be given a concentrated dose of approximately 200 milligrams or so every two weeks. This is common at TRT clinics. Though many experts believe more frequent, less concentrated doses, say 50 milligrams every few days, and even daily microdoses of approximately 25 milligrams are ideal. Whether you wanna look at pharmacokinetics or the natural circadian rhythm of how testosterone is released in your body, it's the closest thing to mimic that. In a medical setting, TRT is usually administered for approximately two months, at which point most people see major improvements in symptomatology. If no improvement is seen in your symptoms, but your biochemistry is balanced, then you should stop treatment because the symptoms are clearly not a result of low testosterone. And any further treatment would put your natural reproductive system in jeopardy. If symptoms do improve, a patient can be on TRT for as long as it is benefiting them, which can often mean for older men the rest of their lives. Assuming you've gotten an actual medical diagnosis, meaning you fit the criteria, an appropriately trained doctor, that is to say one with extended training in the HPG axis and endocrinology, should have no problem prescribing the medication. However, many people choose instead to go to TRT clinics. These clinics vary in structure and operations. Some are run by doctors like endocrinologists and urologists who specialize in hormone therapy and have the necessary medical expertise to prescribe and monitor TRT safely and will adhere to established medical guidelines and prioritize patient safety. However, others are run by individuals who are untrained, unqualified, and may prioritize profit over patient well-being. In other words, there are pill mills. And I don't understand like why they're so incompetent. I actually think it's worse than that. I think that they simply don't understand and don't care. In other words, aesthetics is the primary goal and the primary goal should be health. People likely go to these places when their reason for using isn't medically approved. As in, 
they're just looking to get their testosterone boosted to insane levels. When determining where to go for treatment, you should go by this rule. If your health isn't your priority, then your health probably won't be their priority. That's called mother bars. Now, if you want to go natural natural, some herbal supplements have been shown to increase testosterone levels and don't shut down your body's natural production in the process. Like Tonga Ali and another one which is very interesting, it's a Nigerian shrub called Fadogia agrestis. However, some people are looking for the real deal TRT and that's fair. But again, it's important to be prescribed the right medication for you. Which brings me back to this consideration, whether you're treating central or peripheral hypogonadism. As you recall, I stress the importance of knowing which type you have because it will determine which medication or medications are used. Depending on the case, alternatives to traditional TRT may be better suited or used in combination with traditional TRT. For example, treating central hypogonadism is going to target the pituitary. As Derek from More Plates More Dates explains. What is the release from my pituitary down to my gonads to actually produce the testosterone? The medications used to treat this include SERMs or selective estrogen receptor modulators. In cases where secondary hypogonadism is caused by excess estrogen or estrogen receptor sensitivity, SERMs may be used to block the effects of estrogen on the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, thereby increasing the production of luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, which can stimulate testosterone production. Clomid or clomiphene is a popular serum used. It is a synthetic hormone often used as a fertility drug. It is frequently prescribed off-label as an alternative to traditional TRT. It basically works by tricking the brain via stimulation of GnRH by blocking the estrogen receptor. And voila, more FSH and LH. And voila again, more testosterone. <laughs> However, it's not necessarily viable long-term because as Derek points out, you are essentially putting yourself in a position of long-term estrogen receptor antagonism. Which he goes on to explain means you're going to be missing out on estrogen activity in certain tissues of your body that can negatively affect your overall health. Another option for treating central hypogonadism is GnRH agonists that initially stimulate the pituitary to release FSH and LH, but with continued use, desensitize the GnRH receptors, leading to downregulation and suppression of LH and FSH production. Therefore, this also is not viable long term. Treating peripheral hypogonadism can also be done in a variety of ways. HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin can be used to stimulate the testes. This is sometimes called the pregnancy hormone because of its important role in maintaining pregnancy. In men, it can treat both low testosterone and infertility because it can help the body increase its production of testosterone and sperm. Another option is gonadotropin therapy, directly administering LH and FSH hormones to the testes. Both of these options can either be synthetic analogs or bioidentical hormones. Sometimes aromatase inhibitors are used as adjunctive therapy. Again, in cases where primary hypogonadism is associated with excess conversion of testosterone to estrogen by the enzyme aromatase. However, as I mentioned when discussing SERMs, you don't actually want estrogen too low. And with these aromatase inhibitors, where it's not actually selective in its suppression of estrogen, this is even more concerning. And then they end up with issues like joint pain, memory issues, and severe drops in libido. And what? even fat accumulation. Not to mention, it can seriously affect mood. As pointed out by men's physique champion, author, and peptide advocate, Jay Campbell, estrogen is what confers protection to the biological systems, such as bone mineral, brain health, and cardiovascular health. He goes even further by claiming this. People that think high estrogen symptoms are actually inflammatory responses to too high a body fat and insulin resistance. Interesting. So even in situations where it seems like high estrogen levels are the issue, this may not be the case. Overall, it's important to understand that men need healthy estrogen levels too. Chloe, the estrogen's getting absorbed by your skin. That's why you've been all bloated and moody and a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> 
Basically, all these methods are used strategically and intermittently as part of a comprehensive TRT protocol. Though these are not permanent solutions, they can help with symptom relief, fertility preservation, diagnostic purposes, and act as a bridge to long-term management, while other strategies are considered and any underlying issues are looked into. Side effects of TRT include both immediate and long-term effects. A relatively small number of men experience immediate side effects. These can include acne, sleep apnea, or worsening sleep apnea, breast swelling or tenderness, that is to say gynecomastia, and fluid retention, which can lead to swelling in the ankles or feet. I'm just trying to think the last time we saw a patient who had acne, um, I'll probably see it once a year. Obviously, shrinking of the testes or testicular atrophy and reduced sperm can happen too. As for the timeline, it can happen pretty quickly, but it depends on the individual. Other longer term side effects of TRT can include an increase in red blood cell production, which can lead to blood clots, sometimes in your lungs, a life-threatening condition known as a pulmonary embolism hypertension, thickening of the blood, which can predispose you to stroke and heart attack, thickening of the left ventricle. Though evidence is mixed, it should be known that there is also an increased risk of cardiovascular problems, such as heart attacks, strokes, and heart disease deaths, particularly among older men. So there was um, a very large study that looked at kind of high risk men and they were given testosterone. And at one year, there was a slight increase in the risk of major adverse cardiac events in the testosterone group. Some doctors are also concerned it may contribute to prostate issues as well, such as benign prostatic hyperplasia or non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate, or in some cases, straight up growth of prostate cancer cells. However, some doctors, like Dr. Rainey Malik here on YouTube, claim that it does not negatively impact the prostate, and here's her proof. The largest randomized controlled trial that we have to date. This study was initially designed to look at cardiovascular effects of TRT. It involved 5,000 men who were, on average, 63 years old and had either pre-existing cardiovascular disease or increased risk of it, and low testosterone according to both numerical levels and symptomatology. The results showed there was no significant difference between people who got TRT and people who didn't. From this, it was concluded that it does not increase risk of prostate cancer or urinary complications. Another study conducted by Anthony Gretsch et al. echoed TRT safety, noting that the available evidence indicates that TRT is largely considered to be safe in most men, with a small inherent risk of adverse events in selected high-risk populations of men with multiple medical comorbidities. Again, contrary to popular belief, testosterone replacement therapy does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. And for the most part, people seem to think the benefits outweigh the costs. If you actually clinically need something to then say, what is the downside to TRT? It's like, what is the downside of not being on TRT at that point, potentially? However, that's considering you're taking medically supervised TRT because the costs get much higher when you are taking it irresponsibly. TRT is becoming more controversial as more people start taking it. And it's not that there's necessarily more aging men or the occasional case of low testosterone in a younger man, but there's more awareness of it. TRT ads targeting older men aren't new. It's appealing to the 70 million boomer men unwilling to fade quietly into old age. A quote in a 2020 Harvard Health article written by Dr. Michael O'Leary says, virtually everybody asks about this now because the direct consumer marketing is so aggressive. Tons of men who would never have asked me about it before started to do so when they saw ads that say, do you feel tired? A 2013 study performed by Jason R. Kovac et al. on patient satisfaction with TRT stated that increased awareness of hypogonadism driven by media and pharmaceutical marketing strategies has led more men to seek treatment and diagnosis. Popularity of this treatment increased by 500% from 1993 to 2013. Prescriptions of testosterone have doubled since 2006. That said, it's becoming more popular and many people who are prescribed it, even those aging don't actually need it. Now, if you noticed, all of these statistics noted the rise in prescriptions over a decade ago. Since then, social media usage has become much more prevalent, giving the marketers that much more opportunity to go directly to the consumer. 
And the companies don't even necessarily have to do the marketing themselves. If the product is interesting enough, people online will do it for them and others will simply follow the trend. The pressure people feel to look a certain way has only been exacerbated with social media. People compare themselves with others carefully curated online life and are often left with a distorted perception of what normal actually is. As explained by Vince Del Monte, who is a former WBFF pro fitness model and an online fitness business coach. But we don't know what's real anymore because half of the stuff that we watch is fake. And our desire to keep up with the trend online can filter into our everyday life, which can then feed back into how we present ourselves online. And the cycle continues. What I mean by that is that PED usage in general is both more popular and more available now because of the internet. The monster physique is the real life goal for many men in the fitness and bodybuilding world. For more on this subject, I suggest you watch my recent video on trend. For the purpose of this video, I just mean with so many people trying to keep up with that, the idea of what muscular looks like nowadays is inflated. More people then see this online because again, the outrageous is what trends on social media and then more people both old and young want to look like that. The expectations to look a certain way are so out of whack. The average dude in the gym is just way bigger. For older men, many of whom have had kids already, choosing TRT is understandable. What is concerning is how many young people are interested in it. In 2021, a survey found testosterone supplementation is most common amongst younger men now more than ever before. So somebody who's 25 years old uh, comes to the office and says, I want to be on TRT. Um, that's already a red flag. The general consensus seems to be that if you do not need TRT, which most young people do not, don't take it, bro. Don't take it. It's not going to make you buff or give you an amazing sex life. Remember, this drug shuts down your body's natural testosterone and with prolonged use can lead to infertility, as in like never making babies. I stress the importance for young people, even those with low testosterone, to do all that they can to take care of themselves before choosing to use exogenous testosterone. So if you are currently natural, you have a good level of testosterone in your body and you go on TRT, that makes no sense. This is not gonna do anything for you. It's gonna take what your nuts do for free mm. and make you do it twice a week with a fucking needle. Sure, we've discussed some side effects of TRT, but I think one of the big risks is dependency. If enough exogenous testosterone is taken, it can shut down the system permanently. So TRT often becomes something a person has to take indefinitely. This is common in older men whose natural levels are already on the decline. This is also common in bodybuilders who are taking testosterone because their levels have been so messed up from other steroids. Larry Wheels can confirm this one. Now, going completely off isn't an option for me. I cannot produce testosterone naturally. So it's a big decision to make and one that young men definitely shouldn't rush into for the sake of fitness gains. It's difficult, however, because like everything nowadays, it's so easy to get online from the underground market. As Derek explains. Not that difficult to find a website that sells testosterone or other anabolics and get some Bitcoin and buy it. Similar to Larry Wheel's story, many in the fitness industry will have used steroids and hormones for so many years that their natural testosterone is shot and need to get it somehow. And again, pointed out by Derek, you can't be sure you're gonna get the cool doc who will hook you up with some low T, low key when you go into the medical office. I mean, I am Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, but I probably wouldn't prescribe you testosterone. That means the fitness industry that are suppressed from their hormone use, probably the majority of them are on not scripted TRT. And he goes on to say that the underground market is difficult to monitor and difficult to shut down, often finding loopholes. Even if they do get shut down, another site will pop up under a new domain. They'll use drop shipping and cryptocurrency to make it even harder to track. It can also be dangerous because though some of it will be pharmaceutical grade products that are resold, some of it will be produced in underground labs, making it difficult to ensure quality. That said, 
Just because it's easily available doesn't mean we should treat this purchase like we're buying toothpaste on Amazon. TRT is serious. The DEA classifies it as a Schedule Three controlled substance. Historically been kind of a, a negative connotation associated with testosterone as a drug of abuse in sports has, has sort of tarnished it. This classification is questionable to some, especially given that estrogen and progesterone are not considered regulated drugs at all. Nevertheless, this is what the US government has decided it to be. And this classification may seriously impact how even those with a current prescription access their TRT in the coming years. Policy changes in telemedicine are being considered for rollout in 2024. This new DEA updated rule under the Ryan Haight Act would mean less flexibility for prescribing medications over the phone with or through Zoom calls with a doctor for schedule three, four, and five drugs. This can affect both doctors and patients. Again, Derek points out, this will give doctors increased workload as well as less medication options. As for patients, travel time for more in-person visits, more frequent refill requests, restricted medication options, and higher costs. It's not that this change would make it completely impossible to get prescriptions via telemedicine, but it would make the patient have to jump through even more hurdles to do so such as getting prescription from a doctor with a state DEA license and having them present for the telemedicine consult, stuff like that. This may cause issues for people who currently depend on TRT and are getting their prescriptions filled at a distance. They may choose to forego prescriptions altogether. Like how many people are gonna go to UGL labs after this and just end up on underground testosterone brewed in a bathtub because of this stuff? Derek also points out that this may have been an oversight by the DEA and that by lumping together so many drugs based on their scheduled class, this new rule is going to apply to more drugs than it should. Fortunately, for those on TRT, the DEA received so many complaints about this new rule that the government has granted a temporary extension until December 2024. Regardless of your reasoning for taking the drug, when you get it from such an unregulated place and administer it with no medical supervision, your safety is at risk. And if you are establishing yourself within a risky environment, you may be more likely to keep taking greater and greater risks with your health. It's not this that's the issue, that's the only risk, it's what it can lead to. I'm not necessarily saying it's a gateway drug, but it can be a slippery slope, especially if you're using it for anything other than its intended purposes. Men of all ages seem to think that TRT is a magical solution to any manliness they feel to be lacking. As our bodies and bodily functions change over the years, one thing we can constantly develop is our character. And the more we can identify masculinity with timeless traits like being honorable and doing what's right, being honest, being purpose driven, being strong, not only physically but mentally, being wise, etc., the more likely we will age gracefully. One interesting point about testosterone that Dr. Huberman points out is that testosterone makes effort feel good. There are androgen receptors in the amygdala, which is basically a fear center in the brain, which alerts you during an emergency. And evolutionarily, testosterone binding to this would have helped males overcome the fear of pain and punishment in order to fight for the right to mate. And the surge in testosterone is what causes the shift to the willingness to engage in battle. This is important because it points to an essential effect of testosterone, one that, if we consider its implication in our modern lives, can help men truly live their best life. Effort and leaning into pain and challenge actually has the effect of making the body feel soothed and good. It's a drive. To me, this highlights the importance of having a purpose, one that you're willing to go through challenges for, to work through pain for, something that moves you and keeps you going. And obviously, this highlights the importance of knowing yourself. This is important for everybody, especially aging men. So often do people retire and then what? I'm not saying you have to work, work, work. It's not about a job. It's about having a purpose to give yourself to. And if you don't feel that, I wouldn't be surprised if you display symptoms of low testosterone. And we can definitely set ourselves up for success the younger we get a grasp on this concept. To young people seeking TRT, how many guys in their 20s, 30s, 40s actually don't feel good? If you actually don't feel good, get a therapist. Again, this won't apply to everyone, and I'm not necessarily saying you need a therapist, though having someone to talk to is great. 
but it's about understanding who you are and releasing limiting beliefs about yourself and your life. I truly believe we are naturally healthy and naturally capable of living our best life. Dr. Huberman points out that you can absolutely have and maintain healthy testosterone levels giving you do the right things, especially when you're young. I can tell you that you can get and maintain very healthy testosterone levels without TRT if you do the right things. But if you're not, there's gonna be problems. However, Dr. Huberman also recognizes how difficult it can be for someone already dealing with the symptoms of a disease to do the things necessary to bring their health back into balance. But if you can, and I believe that many people are capable of more than they sometimes think they are, if you can, stay natty, bro. Or at least be reasonable with the practices you're engaged in. I know if I go to the extremes enough, I can get there, right? But what I don't know is how will I perform without all of that assistance? Yes, in this case, Larry is talking about other steroids and not TRT, but I think he brings up a good point. Being able to know what you're truly capable of naturally. I think this is especially important for those seeking to use TRT for performance enhancement. There's no Superman boost from true TRT. It's just meant to bring you to normal levels. However, some people are getting boosted beyond those levels. A lot of fitness influencers that are basically saying they're on TRT, and TRT is actually even being used as a euphemism for basically being on steroids. And I'm not advocating steroid use whatsoever. But if you want to be big, so much so that you're willing to take drugs for it, TRT isn't gonna do it for you. If you're looking to get a fucking race car and then someone's like, here's a Nissan Sentra and you're like, yes. And you're like, hey, should I get a Nissan Sentra? I wanna go fast. Like, no, idiot. <laughs> and in terms of the desire to abuse these drugs to get buff, as Larry points out, going natural or in his case, off steroids helps build character. Forced me to be more disciplined with everything. That means food, recovery, training. Developing character is something you have to do naturally. It's unavoidable. And the use of drugs like TRT, other than in cases where it is absolutely necessary, can make it seem like it is avoidable. This is just a, an excuse to avoid inner work that most men never face head on. That said, TRT is not a fount of youth. It can relieve men of symptoms brought on by low testosterone, working wonders for aging men, and in the rare cases, young men with hypogonadism. However, the overall increase in people using testosterone, scripted and not, highlights the pressure men feel to be a man. Hey, be a man. And I think that it's important we focus on what that means beyond surface level masculinity and connect with the deeper sense of purpose that drives us. It's more than muscles, man. That's all for today, interns. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up to feed the algorithm. And if you are already subscribed, make sure that YouTube didn't unsubscribe you from the channel because they do that sometimes. We are working towards 700K subs, so we don't wanna lose any interns along the way. If you didn't like the video, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. I read as many comments as I can and we use your feedback to make our videos for you better. And don't forget to follow my online gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we post content that helps you move better, prevent injury, and build lean muscle mass so that you can optimize your test levels, bro. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one. Ah!